let me introduce myself. I'm Jim Levinson, director of the Jackson Institute, soon to be the Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, special welcome. We're joined today by a number of the Ukrainian students here at Yale. Uh, our thoughts, prayers. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to imagine um, what you are going through as you are here in New Haven and dealing with the situation at home. So um, thank you for joining us. I'm joined also um, by two of my colleagues up front here. A number are also in the audience. Uh, let me introduce them. Uh, Arne Vestad, uh, professor of history uh, and global affairs. Arne has written an amazing book, uh, History of the Cold War, uh, and has written on and continues to write on great power competition. Um, I'm also joined by Tim Snyder. Uh, if you have walked by a bookstore, turned on the radio, read a newspaper, uh, watched television, uh, you know who Tim probably, you probably know who Tim is. Um, we've had TV crews camped out uh, on the first floor of Horchow Hall now for, for quite some time. Um, Tim has been working in an incredible schedule. Um, very, very grateful that he's here. Uh, what you might not know um, if you've read you know, only his most recent work is that Tim first really, um, you know, his earlier work as a, as a historian before he was a public intellectual, uh, as well as historian, was a book called Bloodlands, which is a history of uh, exactly the area that we'll be talking about today uh, in the post-Stalin era. And I'm also joined by, by Nellie Petlick. Um, Nellie is a graduate student uh, here at Jackson. Uh, she spent four years as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine. And as we talk through things today, I thought it was important not just to think about this from a historical and geopolitical perspective, but to also keep our eye on the human perspective. Uh, and I hope help, um, Nellie might speak to that. Uh, the format today, I want to start with um, a question each to uh, Arne, to Tim, and then to Nellie. Um, possible some follow-up, and then Q&A uh, from you, because I, I, there's a lot of, of expertise and curiosity uh, in the audience today. Uh, I'll work my way down. Um, Arne, let me, let me start uh, with you. You know, you've spent much of your career thinking about great power competition. It wasn't always called that. Does the current situation make sense to you um, from that perspective? And, and with that sort of geopolitical perspective, how should we be thinking about this? So it depends, obviously, on, on whose perspective you see this from, Jim. I mean, I think in, in, in Putin's own mind, it sort of makes sense. I mean, what he is out to do is to try to resurrect some form of Russian empire. Never mind communism, never mind the Soviet Union. I think looking at this otherwise somewhat deranged speech that he gave at the start of this conflict, you can actually understand quite a bit of what Putin thinks that he is after. And to him, it is about not recognizing Ukrainian statehood, but more importantly, not recognizing Ukrainian nationhood, right? Uh, and trying to <coughs> force Ukrainians into this new Russian super state that he wants to set up. So this is a war of conquest of a kind that we rarely see, certainly towards the end of the 20th century. There are very few examples of this. Um, uh, you know, Iraq in, in, in Kuwait, perhaps. So you try to take over someone else's territory and <coughs> make it your own. On your question of whether it makes sense, in a broader uh, perspective, uh, and even from a Russian perspective beyond Putin, absolutely not. I mean, what this will lead to is Russia's isolation. Um, it will create a Russia that is even more, much more dependent on China, which is an angle I hope we can cover here, than, than what has been the case before. Um, it will, of course, also lead to uh, tensions, not just in Europe, but on a, on a, on a global scale. 
that we haven't seen for a very long time, because this war is in no way over. Let me underline that. I mean, that is really, really important, not just because the Ukrainians are fighting for their, for their country, but also because of the reactions that you've seen elsewhere. I mean, how this has brought uh, people, first and foremost in Europe, but also elsewhere, together to a degree that we simply haven't seen before. And if there is another sort of piece of information that people should look at, it is what happened in the German Bundestag this past week, um, which is a sea change in terms of how Germany is approaching its international affairs, coming from a social democratic chancellor and from a green foreign minister. So those are, gonna, I think, going to be the effects. So, so for Russia as a whole, for the international system, it makes no sense whatsoever. But in, in, in Putin's own increasingly deranged mind, you can see what is going to be. Tim, well, what do you think? I, was, I, I, was, I want to ask you sort of from the Russian perspective, you know, what, what's driving this? Does it make sense? Um, and then I'd, I'd love to hear your reaction to, to what Arne said. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I, I want to say, I just want to acknowledge the tremendous um, cognitive inequality which this meeting represents. I wouldn't be here as a historian of Ukraine if it weren't for historians of Ukraine who are now in Ukraine, um, of course, unable to practice their craft because they are refugees or they're in bunkers or they're in basements or they're fighting as soldiers. So if it weren't for my Ukrainian friends and colleagues from whom I've learned, if it weren't for their books, if it weren't for their language, I wouldn't be in a position, I wouldn't have a job at Yale, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. So I just I want to acknowledge that before I say anything else. Um, and Jim, I hope we have a second round of questions before we go to the audience, because I, I want to hear you ask Arnie specifically about China before, before, we, before we do anything else. That seems to me to be incredibly important. Um, so you ask about the Russian perspective. And um, as, I'm, as I'm sure you know, one of the interesting things about this war is that there isn't a Russian perspective. Um, there isn't even the kind of artificial euphoria which was generated back in 2014. So as all of you know, and many of you will intimately remember, because I, I see people who wrote about it and, and, and were there, um, in 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine the first time. In 2014, uh, Russia managed to occupy and annex Crimea and uh, attempted with special forces to, um, to provoke rebellions in eight of the Ukrainian districts, eight of the Ukrainian oblasts, with partial success in two of them. And that partial success had to do with the successful provocation of an artillery war in and around the city of Donetsk in 2014. So um, I just remind you of that because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to set up a certain contrast. Back then, there was a Russian propaganda build up to the war. So in 2013, um, there, there, was a, there was a sequence of propaganda targeted for specific audiences. Um, people on the right were told that Ukraine was, uh, was gay and cosmopolitan, and people on the far right were told that Ukraine was Nazi, and people on the far left were told that Ukraine was, sorry if I got it confused, people on the far left were told that, people were, that Ukraine was Nazi. There was a very coordinated campaign which went on, and Russia basically won that information war, but, more, but, but, but also the Russian public was prepared for something to happen in Ukraine. And then when it did happen, when Crimea was seized, there was this moment of euphoria, a glorious speech in the Russian parliament, you know, parliamentarians in tears, you know, all that sort of thing. That we don't have this time around. Um, there wasn't really a propaganda preparation, you know, for, for this war in, in, in Russia. Um, Putin's given a series of speeches in which he seems almost defensive about what he is doing. Um, you know, he's even used the phrase, like, it might seem hard for you to understand, you know, so when you get to that point as a dictator, you know, and you're, you're almost, you know, you're in this didactic or even hectoring mode with your own people, that's something different than being in the charismatic mode where everyone is going along with you and carrying you and carrying you along. So, um, you know, not to pick on the question, Jim, but I just, I think it's important to note that, that Putin, the relationship between Putin and his own people is quite different than it was 
eight years ago. We don't know exactly what that means yet, but we do know a couple of things. One of them is that right from the beginning, there were, there were peace protests in Russia. And every peace, everyone who protests for peace in Russia knows that he or she is going to be arrested almost immediately. So the people who actually protest presumably represent a very small percentage of the people who sensed that something was wrong. And the sensing that something is wrong is very important in itself because, as, as you all know, it, the, the inf information is controlled in Russia very effectively. So the propaganda might not be working, but the kind of knowledge that we take for granted you know, on this campus and in much of the world, that, that kind of knowledge is not easily available in Russia. So people who protested right away were people who knew, just knew, that something was off, that something was wrong, you know, this war should not, should not, be, should not be happening. The second thing that we know is that this decision was taken by a very small group of people. Um, I mean, by one man, of course, but I think it was only known to a very small group of people, which means that even the Russian elite has not really had a chance to adjust to this or to, to find a way to rationalize it or to make plans for their own future under this regime of sanctions, which has, which has now followed. So, so Russian points of view are much more plural than they were than they were eight years ago, um, and then if but if the question is about how it makes sense to to, to Mr. Putin, I think um, Arne Vestad has already signaled some important things. It it depends. All of this depends on the assumption that there isn't really a Ukrainian nation and there isn't really a Ukrainian state. I mean, as far, as far, I mean, Arne may have another idea, but I mean, as far as I can read it, the, in, the initial operational plan assumed that the government would quickly collapse and its members could be captured and killed along with the entire Ukrainian intellectual and civic and political elite. The idea was that, you know, Ukraine's not really a nation. There's just a thin upper crust of educated people who have been somehow artificially westernized. So as soon as the tanks roll in, they'll try to run, we'll capture them, we'll kill them. And then the Ukrainians are a kind of inchoate mass. They're a kind of undefined group. They're a pre-colonial tribe. They'll just listen to the stronger, right? That I think is the governing assumption. That's a very familiar governing assumption. I mean, to any of those of you who have studied imperial history or colonial history, you'll recognize that assumption that the colonial power says the other state is not really a state. The colonial power says the other nation is not really a nation, right? And it's interesting to see people in the, you know, the post-colonial world, like the Kenyan ambassador, for, example, for instance, to the UN, immediately recognize those, those patterns. Um, but that is the fundamental assumption. And it, it runs, you know, and as a historian, it, it, it always kind of pains me to even contest ideas like this because they're not historical ideas. Like, much as Putin pretends to talk about history, these ideas don't come from history. They come from colonial reflexes, basically. But, so, but I, I, I have to contest them. I just have to make the, the point out the basic problem, which is that you know, no nation and no state is perfect, but the Ukrainian nation and the Ukrainian state are social and political realities insofar as there are <laughs> social and political realities in the world. Those things are not really contestable. And historically speaking, what's odd is that you don't even need to get to Maidan 2014 or invasion 2022 to talk about the Ukrainian nation. I mean, it's true those things have consolidated the Ukrainian nation or they've They've put the Ukrainian nation before our eyes and given us an opportunity to examine it. But, um, but, the, but the idea that there's a Ukrainian nation is just much older than that. Um, I mean, the, 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 the modern Ukrainian national movement goes back 200 years. And before that, there are actually pre-modern elements of Ukrainian nation far before there are actually elements of such a nation in many other places. I mean, not to make the point you know, too strongly, but the history of Ukraine is much older than the history of the United States of America, however, however you wish to calculate it. Um, and so, you know, just looking at it more practically, when the Soviet Union was founded, um, it was founded in the form it was because people acknowledged there was a Ukraine. You know, the so-called Russian Civil War between, you know, let's say 1917 and 1921, which was a very complicated affair involving, you know, people supporting a Russian Empire's revival, people supporting a Ukraine, people supporting a Russian Revolution. That civil war was largely fought in Ukraine, um, and it was fought by a number of important people. Some of, you know, some of the politics, politics was led by someone called Stalin, and those people recognized at the time 
that there was a Ukraine. They knew they were fighting against Ukrainian armies, right, at the time, a hundred years ago. And the Soviet Union was formed as a union of republics, as opposed to some kind of, you know, homogenous revolutionary unit, because everyone knew at the time there was a Ukraine. If you, if you look at the writings, you know, I'll just like randomly pick some sources, but if you look at League of Nations reports, or if you look at the writings of Josef Roth, or like whatever cultural or literary or statistical analysis you, you, you kind of prefer from the 1920s, Ukraine as a category was widely known to everyone. It wasn't some surprising thing, right? And so its existence with, I'm not gonna do all of Soviet history here, I'm just trying to make the point that its existence was already widely acknowledged 100 years ago. And the fact that you would have to fight to get control of it and that this was dangerous, this was known to the Bolsheviks. It was known to Lenin and Stalin. And of course, it was also known to a later generation of Soviet rulers, such as Khrushchev, who was sent to pacify Western Ukraine at the end of the Second World War. The insurgency and counterinsurgency in Western Ukraine after the Second World War required hundreds of thousands of deaths and hundreds of thousands of sentences to the gulag for it to be brought down. So those are things that like base that students of history would know. And what Mr. Putin has succeeded in doing is forgetting Soviet history, right? Arne referred to a kind of Western, a kind of Russian empire I mean, the kind of Russian empire he has in mind is a kind of mishmash of all of the things that he likes from history. But what he succeeded in driving away is actual Soviet history and the rec at least the practical recognition that there was such a thing as the Ukrainian nation, which at a certain time everybody knew. What he's managed to do is to take a kind of extreme version of the 1970s when he was formed, a time of Russification in the Soviet Union. And then as he's aged in the last decade especially, he's taken on elements of extreme right Russian nationalism and pushed these to this kind of logical conclusion, which he now seems to have settled on, that there's no Ukrainian nation and no Ukrainian state. And of course, that's that's not true. Um, and now that it's been proved not to be true, it seems like he has no choice but to try to you know double down, as one does when one is a tyrant. And then that leads to the, the consequences that Arne was was speaking about. Thank you, Tim. Nelly, what are you hearing from your friends and colleagues? Yeah, um, so just sort of to add a little bit about my background, since I think uh, most of you know uh, these two professors here. Um, so I was in Ukraine for, for four years, as Jim said, for the first two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in, in a small town in south central Ukraine, um, where I had the opportunity to meet Oleksii five years ago at a camp. Um, and then I decided to stay and I started working for Education USA, uh, which is a network of the State Department that uh, promotes uh, US higher education opportunities. And so uh, during that time, for about a year and a half, I was doing outreach and I had the immense opportunity to travel to 21 out of 24 uh, regions of Ukraine and really see the diversity uh, of the country. Can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay, good. So I think. You know, as a Peace Corps volunteer, I was in a town of 15,000 people. Um, I was, there was another American there, but he was working on different projects in a different part of, part of the city. So uh, really I was, you know, there was nothing special about my position there. I was integrating into the community, learning the language, um, treated just as any other teacher. I was an English teacher at a high school. Um, so I was at all the staff meetings and, and, and everything like that. You know, I wasn't treated any differently as, as an American. And so, um, one thing that I really want to highlight is the generosity of the Ukrainian people. It's hard to even talk about. Um, it's gonna be a long hour, guys, sorry. Um, in our training, when they were sort of preparing us to culturally adapt to Ukrainian life, they talked to us about how Ukrainians have an outer circle and an inner circle. And the outer circle can be really hard to get through um, because Ukrainians um, and other Slavic people don't smile at you on the street, you know, like we do in America. And so it might seem that they're very cold. Um, but we were told once you get into that inner circle, there's nothing else like it and you're treated like family. And I found that to be incredibly true. Um, and it was a generosity that I really struggled to understand and even to accept. Um, I just didn't, I couldn't really comprehend how people could be so generous to someone that they didn't even know, especially after all of the horrors that they have been through in their history, as I'm sure Professor uh, Snyder will, will talk about. I just couldn't believe that they would be so welcoming to a stranger because Ukrainians are the type of people who give you everything they have even when they have nothing left. Um, 
And I think we're seeing that right now. So I would just say sort of from the human perspective, um, I'm really, really glad that the world is seeing right now the generosity and the love and the fierceness to resist of the Ukrainian people. And Putin truly, truly messed with the wrong people. Um, and I think, I think we're all seeing that. Um, and in terms of sort of what I'm hearing and seeing, uh, Peace Corps volunteers, Ukraine was the biggest Peace Corps country for many, many years. So peace, returned Peace Corps volunteers are now mobilizing. There's a network of about 1,100 of us right now working to help, of course, friends and family that we still have there, arrange humanitarian aid, things like that. Um, but so much of that is already, of course, already happening in Ukraine. I'm in, in touch with my community there. And I got um, a message from a friend of mine there about two days ago. And she said, you know, in all the chaos and everything, people are abandoning their pets. Is there any way that you can help out, get, get us some funds so we can be buying food and, and shelters for these animals? Um, and so that's what people there are thinking about right now. They're mobilizing um, to help people out. You know, they're settling um, IDPs in my town right now. Um, even though they themselves are, are at war, they're doing everything they can to help people who have fled from other parts of the country. So I think that's just what I want to highlight is the generosity and, and the love. And I'm just really glad that the rest of the world is seeing um, the spirit of, of Ukrainians right now. Thank you. Arne, I want to follow up a little bit on, on couple things you said. Um, there was mention of this leading to a Russia that is more dependent on China. Um, you also spoke, I think the phrase was tensions in Europe. Um, it'd be great if you could follow up on both of those. In terms of tensions in Europe, my read is that this has brought Europe more together, um, which I don't so I, I was puzzled by the use of, of the phrase tensions. Maybe you could uh, say a little bit about that. And then moving forward with a Russia more dependent on China, how does that change sort of how we, we think about the, the global balance of power such that it is? Mm. So let me talk about the China angle to this first because it is really, really important. Um, and we don't know yet exactly how it is going to play out. Um, what's happening right at the moment is that the Chinese leaders are getting increasingly embarrassed, as they should be, with the behavior of their close partner in, in trying to destroy Ukraine. Um, what we need to do is to push even harder than what we've done in order to increase that uh, sense of um, embarrassment of, 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 of being uh, hurt both directly and indirectly by what their partners are doing. Um, it's interesting that that was not the initial Chinese reaction. I mean, the initial Chinese reaction was very clearly um, that this was something that would work to China's advantage if the Chinese leaders were able to sit very still and do very little. And then the, the reactions, the international reactions against Russia's mm -hmm. behavior would force Russia even more closely to China, uh, to put it bluntly, to be exploited more efficiently mm -hmm. uh, by China the way Russia is already today. One of the big issues that you should tell all of your Russian friends, if you haven't, is that Putin's strategy has led to an almost complete loss of Russian sovereignty with regard to China, who was taking advantage of this even before the invasion and attempted occupation of Ukraine took place, but now seem to be having a, a, an even better opportunity. The problem, however, for the Chinese leadership is that what we see now of our television screens, of the behavior that Russian troops are showing in Ukraine, goes against so much of what they themselves have tried to propagate to the world of Chinese aims ever since the People's Republic of China was set up in 1949 on the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, non-intervention, you know, which the Chinese have been going on about for a very long time. So these are the buttons that we should try to hit. And I've been trying to hit as well with the, with the Chinese when I speak to, to people and, and news outlets in China about this. Um, and I think that sense that this is problematic, including to, ex to explain to their own people uh, what is going on, is now increasing uh, in China. It was very interesting to see today that they're also starting to prepare uh, 
for, a, for an economic backlash, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, which is, in my view, entirely dominated by China, has now stopped issuing loans to Russia. And the reason why they've done that is not because the Chinese are moving away from the Russians diplomatically, but because of the fear of the effect of US and Western secondary sanctions, um, which could hit that bank, will hit that bank, uh, if they continue their, their current lending activities. So these are the kinds of things that we that we ought to we ought to think about. I think it is important in the kind of situation that we have now to continue to speak to the Chinese about this, um, even though the answers we get are not the the answers that we would we would like to have. But China is going to be important with regard to this. I also think, speaking of the popular level, I think among ordinary people in China, in spite of the heavily censored Chinese media there is an increasing concern about what is happening. I was going to ask you about that, because yeah. I know you stay in touch with yeah. colleagues there, speak the language. I think there is absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and it is interesting, it's interesting particularly over the last three to four days to see how that has increased. And that's obviously also something by, you know, by publishing in Chinese, because Chinese are smart people, they find their way around the... the great firewall that the, the regime has set up to prevent them from getting information. So, so we should do more on that. Just quickly, Jim, on, on Europe. So when I use the term tension, I meant first and foremost in, in terms of the relationship between Russia and the rest of Europe. Um, that's where, um, you know, for a very long time, very clearly, there is going to be um, uh, increased tension. It's true that this has brought Europe together to a remarkable degree, but the, the question still remains, and we have to be able to ask ourselves these tough questions. What should Europe, which is really at the front line of this conflict, do you know, with regard to the, the fighting that goes on at the moment? And on that as well, there are different answers. I am really struck by the degree to which uh, European neutrals, like Finland and Sweden, have been willing to try to support Ukraine militarily in a way that, again, only a few weeks ago, no one would have mm -hmm. dreamt about uh, being possible, uh, and, and resupplying them with weapons that they actually need, because these are the kinds of weapons that they have developed for their own defense, uh, obviously thinking ahead about, about Russia. I think that's hugely important, because it's going to spill over to other European countries as well. In what well, to me is the crucial willingness to, to resupply Ukrainians who are fighting for their lives against this invasion. I want to underline that. So there are, there are some people in Europe uh, and there are some people here who are saying we have to be careful with this because we do not want to unleash the Third World War. Now, with regard to resupplying the Ukrainians, on the ground with the kind of weapons that they actually need at the moment. That is not risking a third world war. That is making the risk of a third world war uh, significantly lower than what it would have been not doing that. Because it's only if uh, Putin's regime realizes that they, they get the kind of resistance that we are now seeing in, in Ukraine that it will be possible to push back in later cases as well. If we don't do that, the situation would be much more dangerous. So I think it's, it, it is important to underline that aspect of it as well. I was up at, uh, in a prearranged visit up at West Point yesterday and spoke to, spoke to people there about it. And uh, as many of you will know, military people tend to be the most reluctant that we have to, to think about actually getting involved in foreign conflict. But I wanted to get across to them that, you know, resupplying Ukraine uh, in any way that we can, is actually for the, in a strategic sense, for the good of this country and for the good of Europe. Tim, do you want to add anything to that? I just I wanted to say um, that I, I very much appreciated Nellie's Nellie's remarks about her time in in Ukraine. Um, it's you know in in so far as we. Insofar as we have anything to say, you know, it's because we've at some point had someone to talk to and someone someone to learn from. So I very much appreciated that. I'll just I'll just add a, maybe a couple of brief words about 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 Europe um, and about Russia. What I wanted, I mean, go, going back to um, the, your initial question, Jim. One thing that I wanted to say, which I forgot to say, is that 
even in the Soviet Union, Ukraine was governed as Ukraine. So I mean, it was governed. It was governed at, at times with horrible repressiveness, as for example during the first five-year plan, um, which led to political decisions in Moscow um, to allow about four million Ukrainians to die in a famine who did not have to die. Um, and, and that, by the way, goes to the question in another way because when you ask, you know, what what is Putin thinking? Um, he's thinking that none of that is true, you know, whereas for, for Ukrainians, uh, you know, regardless of whether the Holodomor comes up in political conversations or not, it's a lived family reality. It's a matter of, you know, grandparents, great-grandparents. People know it's true whether you talk about it or not, whether it comes up in international politics or not. And that, you know, that interpretation of, of the Stalin years is one of the things which marks off Ukrainians from, from Russians. You know, people, when it comes to identity, everybody wants to make like these quick jumps, like it should be about language. And, you know, that's like a shortcut and it's completely wrong and I wish people wouldn't do it. You know, I mean, Arna speaks Mandarin, but that doesn't, you know, <laughs> you know, right? Though, though I have had people, Tim, in China asking me which part of China I was from. But that's, that, that's good. Stop. That's stop, good. Stop now, that's, I think. That's good. That's as, that's, as, that's as good as it gets with languages. When people, like, know, they think you're from their country, but they're not sure which part. That's, that's about as good as it gets. But you, you see my point. I mean, we're all, we're all speaking English here, but, I mean, there may not be anybody in this room who's from the United Kingdom. And if, you know... And if you are, you're probably too shy to say so. Um, so, but but so, but people want there to be a shortcut. They want to say like, I want to be able to say who you are because of how you look or you know what you say. But identity is actually about experience, about you know that biographical experience, your own experience, the experience of your family, the experience that you think you understand, and the experiences of Ukrainians. You know, not just in the last decade, not just in the last few days, you know, but in the last few years with Maidan in the last 30 years with a generation of people who have grown up in what is a, a, a admittedly a cr sometimes cranky and ramshackle and unpredictable but nevertheless independent state you know pe pe people who are few people who are you know 45 and under now have 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 had the dominant experiences of their life in an independent ukraine but it goes back much further than that it goes back, the differences go back hundreds of years, and I won't, I won't bore you with them um, because that's what I work on, and you should always know that what you yourself work on is going to be boring to an audience, so I won't dwell on it. But the, 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 point, though, the point, though, is that when, pe when you want to see the difference between Russians and Ukrainians, it's often like it's a matter of experience, and, uh, and, and the Stalin period is something that what Putin is trying to literally like write it out and flatten it out. I don't know how many of you pay attention to these memory laws, but there's a law in Russia which says that you're not allowed to speak about the period 1939 to 1941. You're quite, and then right before the invasion, that, that the criminal penalties on that particular law were strengthened, um, and not accidentally, because Putin's behavior is very much like Stalin's behavior in 1939. He's going, e he's going west. He's claiming that it's to rescue endangered compatriots. He's claiming that he's doing it because the state to his immediate west no longer really exists or doesn't exist. Um, that's pretty much exactly what Stalin said in 1939 when the Soviet Union invaded invaded Poland. Um, but my deeper point here is that. The, 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 what the Russian leadership is doing is flattening out a history which is central to the memory, the lived memory, not the political memory of, of people in, in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so that's, that's one thing that I wanted to get to, that there is this Soviet, there's this Soviet experience which was very different for Ukrainians and for Russians and is, and is remembered as such, but that even in the Soviet Union, no one was denying that there was a Ukraine. Like it was governed as a, it was governed as a Ukraine, and that's what, as Arne was saying, that's what makes this proposal to govern Ukraine as Russia so radical. That's never been done, ever. The Russian Empire was not a Russian national state. It didn't operate according to national principles. The people who governed it, not to put too fine a point on it, were not Russians. It, the elite in the Russian Empire was not ethnically Russian for the most part. Um, it was, you know, you, you look surprised. It was German and Swedish. You know, it, it was Polish. Um, the, you know, when the, when the Russian Empire took took over Kiev in the late 17th century, that was the that was the only high edu institution of higher education that they had. So, I mean, there were no public, there was no publishing, there was no university in Russia at the time. But so, 
What I'm trying to say is that like this notion of Russia governing Ukraine as Russia is entirely anachronistic and novel. It's never happened before. And so Putin like reaching back and talking about a thousand years and all this total nonsense, Russia wasn't a modern nation then, right? The Russian empire controlled much of what is now Ukraine, but it wasn't governing it as a national state. The Soviet Union controlled what is now Ukraine, but it wasn't governing it as a national state. The idea that a Russian, a Russian on a Russia on ethnic principles can dominate Ukraine is a really radical idea. It's the most radical version of how to govern Ukraine that's ever been around, except for the Nazi one. And it's coming at a point in history where the Ukrainian nation has been most most fully formed. So I just I wanted to bring that particular point, like that, to it to to into a, to a sharp point. Thanks. Yeah, one last question, and it's not a very fair one, uh, before we open it up. Um, you know, Ar Arne, you said it's important to realize this is not close to being over. Um, it's an important point. I'm wondering if either you or Tim would be willing to hazard a guesstimate, a prediction, as to how this, I don't want to say ends because it will be ongoing, but how this plays out over the next 6 to 12 months. <laughs> and as I said, I know yes, it's not a fair question. Um. Well, you also get a slightly unfair answer to it, Jim. It won't end until the Russian troops have withdrawn from Ukraine. I mean, that's the, that's the key element that it's important to recognize now. I mean, the idea that it's possible to get any kind of settlement that will lead to um, any form of st stability, even the kind of stability that Putin wants to impose in Ukraine without a withdrawal of Russian troops is unimaginable. And we are seeing that now every day on the streets of Ukrainian cities. Um, the big question is, of course, how long it will take before the Russians in charge realize that that is the case. And, and the only answer I have to that is that that depends on the degree of pressure, not just the, the pressure they get by a lot of, of young Russian people coming back to Russia in coffins, to put it bluntly, but also the kind of pressure that we can put uh, on Russia. So uh, as people up here now, I've worked very closely with, uh, with colleagues in, in Russia for, for, for quite some time uh, as an historian, because parts of my interest have been connected to, to Soviet history. Um, and, of course, I try to make use of that opportunity to contact people while, as I was saying to Tim the other day, while I was resigning from the various boards and committees and various other things that I found myself on in Russia, uh, also to, to, to contact uh, uh, friends and, and, and colleagues and acquaintances directly and, and, and tell them both why I've done that, but also what I think the consequences for Russia will be of, of, of what they have now done. So I think I think that's in a way the 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 the, the timeline here. So this is also why China is important, right? Uh, let me just comment on that very briefly, if I can, Jim, again, because you know this is the first global crisis where I think that China potentially has more influence than this country. Mm -hmm. right? Interesting. And so what I and others are trying to tell our Chinese friends is that with great power comes great responsibility. You can't simply sit back and do nothing and hope that the whole thing will blow over in a way that will serve you. You can't do it for domestic reasons and you can't do it for international reasons. And here are some parallels, imprecise as they might be from history, uh, but concerning as they, as, they, as they are, need to be put to them. So one of the perspectives that I now put to my Chinese friends is the parallel which I've been discussing in other contexts with the kind of global situation that we see now and the situation in Europe at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Right? Where you had this tremendous growth in, in German power. Germany had just been reunified. It was industrializing. It was at the forefront of technology. It was obviously moving towards and aiming towards a dominant position in Europe. Right next to Germany was a... Um, ancient but rather decrepit empire, Austria-Hungary, which had problems with a lot of nationalities inside the empire, but also along its borders. 
And for reasons that were, uh, were strategic in a very limited sense, Germany increasingly became a close ally uh, of that uh, empire, even if the Germans knew that this would lead to trouble. This, you know, there would be difficulties coming out of that. Um, they couldn't foresee what happened in the summer of 1914, but there were clearly were difficulties. This is an imprecise, but still rather instructive parallel to the relationship between China and Russia today. And it should really be a memento for the, for the Chinese leaders to think about this, that they could end up in a kind of situation because of what the Russians are doing that would really move China away from the path that it's on now, to, even within its own region, towards further, further influence for, for, for reasons that are not primarily of Chinese doing, because they're sitting back on this, but because of their uh, studio alliance with the Russians. Tim, do you want to? Yeah, let me let me have a crack at that from from a different from a different angle. Um, I mean, I, I from a great distance, um, Arne, I'm I'm also struck by this sort of triangle of of U.S., China, Russia, where the ch it's the, the Chinese. It seems to me could turn this off in a heartbeat if they wanted to, but their first reaction is to put the responsibility on us, and we actually have much less ability to do anything about it one way or another. There's something very striking about, about that juxtaposition. But on, on how this comes to an end, I just want to stress one dimension of it, which we haven't really talked about, um, which is the dimension of, of, of unreality, the dimension of propaganda or information, the dimension of how people think about all of this. Because well, of course, you know the war. The war in Ukraine is very real, and you know people people are people are killing and dying now. You know, a, a, and living. I mean, um, a, a treasured colleague, incredible person, just got married um, in her bulletproof vest before this thing started. Uh, it, it, nevertheless, it's also very important to ask whether reality, you know, I'm very old fashioned about these things, I believe in facts and truth and so on, um, whether whether reality defends itself against unreality. Because what's, what's been characteristic of 21st century war in Russia has been that the informational character has run out way ahead of the kinetic character. So they've done much better in the war for mines than they've done in the war for territory in general. And, um, and this is a reflection of an interesting turn that was taken in Russian politics and society in the early 21st century. Um, Peter Pomerantsev has a really good book about this called um, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, where you know, once, the, when, once certain conditions prevail, extreme inequality of wealth, centralization of media, you know, major oligarchical clan is in charge of the state, you can, you can govern not by promising people policy based on facts that changes the future, but you can govern by having the best spectacle and by crowding out other spectacles or other sources of information. And so Russia then has been fighting wars that way, and the war in 2014 against Ukraine was a success in that way. It wasn't actually a battlefield success particularly. It went less well for them than they expected on the battlefield, but they did a very good job with Western public opinion, and they did a very good job with American public opinion. Um, they managed to prevent American and European elites from seeing the basic things that were happening, right? It's still hard, it's, people still feel a kind of internal resistance to saying Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, although that's the most, you know, that's the simplest, most lapidary, mm -hmm. most accurate characterization of what, of what happened. Um, there are all kinds of pre-programmed reflexes that people have to, instead of that, even though that's, you know, that's the most important thing that happened. For this war, it has gone less well for Russia. People learned a lot in the last eight years. Um, uh, U Ukrainians learned a lot. Um, it's, 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 the Ukrainians have done a very good job at expressing themselves as themselves. So not trying to take up the cudgels and fight a Russian style information war, but rather do creative, interesting things, you know, to try just to make it clear that they're real and they have a character. Even their propaganda directed against the Russians is often very interesting or even has a kind of almost humanitarian tone to it. So the Ukrainians have done a better job, but the larger, but the larger issue here is um, reality. You know, can we talk to Russians and just help them understand what's going on without browbeating them? You know, can we, can we get to our Russian friends and colleagues or their colleagues or our Russian cousins and their cousins and just communicate a little bit? 
is the West going to do a better job at talking about what's actually going on, which doesn't mean making better propaganda. I don't think we win with better propaganda. I don't think, you know, I don't think that's really our job. But can reality as such hold back unreality? That's a big, so if this thing only comes to a close, if we continue to get, keep a grip on what's actually happening on the battlefield, that's a big part of it. If we drift off into propaganda stereotypes or wishful thinking, you know, or we spend our time talking about the concepts that Mr. Putin wants us to talk about, you know, then then this goes on, right? So I just, I, I, I think it can, I mean, I don't want to dodge the question, Jim. I do think this can end. I mean, I, I can imagine a, an arrangement whereby this would end. But like everything else, it depends, like, you know, like everything else, like this conversation itself, it depends upon the Ukrainians continuing to fight, right? I mean, imagine a, imagine a world in which the Ukrainians hadn't fought. It's a very different world, right? But if the Ukrainians hadn't fought, we would not be thinking about all the things we're thinking right now, right? If the Ukrainians hadn't fought, that wouldn't make Putin a better dictator or the Russian system a better system. We just wouldn't be thinking about it in the same way. If the Ukrainians hadn't fought, you know, people around the world wouldn't have had a chance to think about what they, you know, to think about what colonization and decolonization mean or to think about what democracy and oligarchy mean, right? They've given, they've given us this chance, including the chance to have the conversation that we're, that we're having right now. But for there to be some kind of a settlement, I mean, there's, there are, Arne has already mentioned all the parts. The Ukrainians have to keep fighting People have to keep helping them. There has to be a conversation, if that's the word, among Russian elites. Um, there has to be resistance upon, on the part of the Russian population. And big powers like China and America have to keep nudging and suggesting possible ways out. Can I, can I add something on that? Please, please. Um, so I just wanted to add that even after, so I've been in the prediction business for a couple of years, so I won't speak to, speak to that part. But um, even after the Russian troops withdraw from Ukraine. This will not be over for Ukrainians for a very, very long time. Um, so I'm so glad to see so many people here today. We maxed out the attendance. And so I want to ask you to resist the urge to disengage, because even in a week, I've seen a big difference in the way I have the New York Times sort of live stream updates on my uh, computer. And I've seen a big difference in the way that they're covering things, even, when, even within a week. Um, and I also forgot to mention, as part of my background, I've been working with the State Department for about nine months now, tracking Russian disinformation efforts and, and synth synthesizing those for um, government partners. So I have some background there and can speak to that and can say that they're actively right now pushing narratives and pushing efforts to try to get Western allies to disengage from this issue. So um, just something to keep in mind as this goes on. Um, that's true for so many tragedies and conflicts that happen around the world, um, it inevitably happens, but you know, there's been a hot war raging in Eastern Ukraine for eight years and the West disengaged from it, um, really stopped covering it, and it's part of the reason that we're here today. So just something to, to keep in mind. Nelly, thanks. I'd like to open it up with the remaining time for a few questions. Um, Jimmy Hatch. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm a veteran and I served in a bunch of different conflicts in the past in our history, and this reminds me particularly of the former Yugoslavia. And while I'm not culturally aware of the Ukrainians, um, their history. I do think that there's the opportunity for what happened in the former Yugoslavia when um, the people who did the bad things there, who created the mass graves, they, they concentrated everybody's attention on Sarajevo. And during that time, they were doing things in the other part of the country. And I'm worried that that, for example, this morning when I saw the news about yep. the nuclear plant being uh, shelled, what do they not want us to see? And what do you think, how do you think that they'll, they'll keep our attention focused and do something in a different part of the country. What do we need to be looking for there? Thank you. Are we doing this one by one? Or? Yeah. No, I, I think that's a very apt observation. I mean, the, the, the Russians are not on their, on their best game with the propaganda and the provocation yet because I believe their, understand, their, their, their expectation was that Ukraine was gonna fold within 24 hours. Um, and that we, we think that not just because of how of how they um, set up quote unquote the the first stage of the operation, but also because of some things that were accidentally published in the Russian press, uh, which basically they accidentally published some of their victory declarations, which if you haven't seen them are absolutely chilling um, because they basically speak of a of what you know what Rafael Lemkin 
called a genocide in which the, the nation has been decapitated and everyone else just has no choice but to go along and Ukraine has essentially ceased to cease to exist. Um, so uh, they're not on, they're not, in, in terms of provocation and ideology and disinformation, I think it's only going to get stronger, as I think maybe Nelly was suggesting, as, as they try to, because they, they went in doing one thing that didn't work, and now they're still, I think, trying to figure out how they're going to talk about what they're doing, and whether it's hard for them to talk about it because they're not really sure themselves. It's it's Putin doubling down, and they have to win, but what winning means, they don't know. And of course, I agree with Arne, like, it's going to be I don't think they're going to win ever, but you know the question is whether the question is whether there's some kind of acceptable solution in months, you know, or whether or whether it's like Afghanistan plus for them in 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 years and horror for and horror for the Ukrainians. Uh, but I mean, what what I think is real is the attempt to assassinate the Ukrainian leadership, and that's something which is difficult to keep your eye on. Um, but I think important not to forget about, and I don't think the Russians have forgotten about it, um, that, that this war was about decapitation, um, announced as such, pretty much pretty explicitly. We should probably, you know, probably remember that. And if Ukrainian leaders, you know, disappear or whatever it might be, there's a pretty strong presumption about, about what might, what is in fact happening, you know, and that, I mean, I, that Putin's concept is that Ukraine doesn't exist. There are just a few thousand, you know, artificial, what, what, like the, when those people start disappearing, you know, we, we can, I mean, that's just a horrible thing to say, but that plan has already, has essentially been announced. Please. And do you, do you need the microphone yes. yep. so that uh, the live, the streaming can catch it? Um, first, I want to say thank you to the panelists and everyone for coming out. It's been really instructive and eye-opening to kind of hear your perspectives. I'm very appreciative um, as just like a passive American observer of what's going on. Um, I, I have seen sort of several narratives uh, put forth in the last week that perhaps some of what is motivating Russia right now to kind of get in themselves into this mess um, beyond just sort of the ideological state defining um, stuff is is actually like sort of uh, maybe also a battle over resources, specifically oil and natural gas um, with the the natural gas found in the Black Sea uh, but just prior to the 2014 invasion, um, which Russia controlled Crimea now that that would be the the main way that Ukraine could have exploited those natural gas resources. Um, but then there's still some that are available from Odessa and other ports that Ukraine still controls in the Black Sea. Um, and I was, and I guess so. If Ukraine were to exploit these natural gas resources and become the new Eastern European petro state, um, which theoretically could threaten the Russian economy, which is primarily based on the exploitation of uh, fossil fuels and the sale of them to the European continent. Um, I was just wondering if you experts think there's any validity to that theory or if it's sort of maybe sideshow distraction or, um, yeah, just anything you might speak about that sort of energy and resource side of things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that's one of the key reasons why Putin has acted the way he has. Uh, we know, again, from some of these leaked documents that Tim referred to, that in part of how this is being presented, was supposed to be presented after a victory uh, fr from the Russian side, then the idea was that this would strengthen this new cohesion that had been created around Russia economically, also with regard to access to resources, which then, in Putin's telling, the West was trying to cut off in order to strangle Russia. I mean, entire nonsense, of course, with regard to it. But, so I don't think that's what we should be looking at most closely. I think the, the as Tim has been saying, the, the central idea here is about the attempted destruction of Ukrainian nationhood. And that is a story that is first and foremost Putin's story about Russia <laughs> and about the kind of Russia that he wants to see projected into the future. Um, and this is where some of the dissonance comes up as well. I mean, I, I do think that is actually quite, quite important to note here. 
And I, I, I really appreciated what Tim said about this being a very novel way of thinking about how to rule how to rule Ukraine. I hadn't given enough thought to that, and I think that's a really, really good point. But it also is a way of thinking that it seems to me is out of whack with almost everything that is happening elsewhere in the world. And getting back to the Chinese and Asian side, this is the kind of thing that I think is really difficult for their elites to get their heads around. I mean, they don't like us very much, necessarily. They don't like the, the, the way the United States is, is, is governed or the way Europe is governed or anything of that sort. But there is still a, in terms of conversations and in terms of discussions, <laughs> as some of my Chinese friends like to say, we, we do speak the same language, right? <laughs> in terms of the things that matter and the things that matter less. In terms of Putin's Russian elite, that is not the case. I mean, there is a there is a kind of of of, of discourse that seems to be entirely internal uh, to that particular elite. And on the issue of resources, you know, I, I think in most other settings, for, with this kind of effort being put into taking over another country, that would have ranked fairly highly up, you know, on the agenda. It doesn't in the Russian case. Uh, and the reason for that is that the discourse is different right, from, from what you find in many other settings. At least that would be my response to it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Amer America and Russia are very, are very different. But if you think back to the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, anybody looking at it at the distance would have said, oh, yeah, isn't that about mm -hmm. the oil fields? Mm -hmm. But somehow it wasn't even about the oil fields, right? It was about views about the world and how the world was going to change after a war and so on, which which were which were entirely wrong. You know, just as these ideas are entirely wrong. Um, I, I just wanted to. I wanted to. I agree completely with what Arne said. I wanted though to tack on to your question a kind of larger observation, which is that the 21st century is a century of hydrocarbon oligarchy and getting to the 22nd century is going to be a matter of breaking up hydrocarbon oligarchy, foreign and domestic. And this entire war wouldn't be possible without the, the way that the Russian state is constructed as a hydrocarbon oligarchy. And, you know, I mean, of course, day to day, month to month, what we need to be thinking about are the Ukrainians and supplying the Ukrainians. But this is this whole war is actually one more piece of evidence that we need to shift to mm. clean and safe sources of energy. Um, that's so. This is this isn't a distraction. I mean, we shouldn't be thinking of this as a distraction from climate change. This would be like one more reason why we need to be shifting over to different sources of energy. So I'm mindful of the time, and I'm mindful of the fact that we're holding this at a. Uh, day and time where classes actually are in session. Uh, so with some regret, I'm going to call it to a close. Uh, we could talk for a long, long time. And as uh, Nellie said, I hope, I hope we will be. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for their time this morning. And most of all, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for taking time out of your day, showing the concern um, that's evidenced by your being here on a Friday morning. Thank you so much. <laughs>